British Columbia, John Oregon is in the house. He'll be in that chair facing the questions of Von Palmer. This is huge. This is like George Clooney coming back to ER. It's like Madonna showing up on Will and Grace. And we've saved it for you, our faithful Voice of BC viewers. Okay, everybody take a Valium. <laughs> Good evening and welcome to Voice of BC. I'm Von Palmer. Yes, and tonight's guest is the Premier of the province, John Horgan, in what I believe is his 14th appearance on this show with me as host, but the first time as Premier. Yes, uh, good to be back on the program, uh, Vaughn, and it's great to have uh, Jordan introduce me as uh, either George Clooney or Madonna. I'm not sure which one. Well, uh, I remember once you said when you were uh, in opposition, uh, and maybe not on one of your happier days, that you said you thought had always thought yourself as a happy warrior. You had some dark and frustrating days in 2015 in particular, and here you are. I've covered 10 premiers and counting, and I think you may be the happiest one I've covered yet. I've been smiling for about six months, Vaughn, and, I, and people have asked me, you know, what's, why are you so happy? I mean, you've got all these big challenges ahead of you and uh, a minority parliament, and what, what, what makes you get up every morning with a smile on your face? And it's, it's being freed from the, uh, the burden of opposition. And I've, I said on this program in one of those visits that being in opposition is really tough because you're, you're obliged to hold the government accountable, which inevitably means being negative. And I'm not negative by nature. I'm positive and optimistic by nature. So to be able to now be myself, genuinely be myself in the role that, uh, of uh, leader of the government is pretty exciting for me. And every day is a new experience and I'm, I can't, get wait, can't wait to get going every morning. You said it's uh, maybe the toughest decision your government faces in its first term. It certainly is one of the toughest. Next Thursday, I think it is, the November the 30th, the cabinet gathers to hear presentations from six experts on site C, and then sometime over the next few weeks it has to make a decision. So tell me about the experts. It's very unusual to get people in to do that, to talk to cabinet about what you're, what you're going to do on site C. Well, as you know, Vaughn, one of the t topics that I talk about when I come on this program is energy. I know a lot about it. I was the energy critic for a decade in the opposition, and I worked in energy when I was in government. So I want to make sure that my caucus and my cabinet are as well informed as possible on what is a very, very important decision, a multi-billion dollar decision that's going to have an impact on people, not just right away, but for a long period of time. Energy is critical to our economy, critical to our, our way of life here in British Columbia. And we have historically had very low rates compared to other jurisdictions but over the past number of years rates have been creeping up it's had an impact on business uh, uh, industry large industry constantly looking for breaks on energy costs the former government would provide that we ourselves gave a break on uh, PST for uh, in business buying energy to try and give them a bit of a break from increased costs but at the end of the day people have been getting increased bills year after year after year so during the campaign, we committed to freeze rates and figure out where we go from here. And in that process, of course, we have to decide on what to do with the largest public project BC Hydro has ever undertaken, the Site C Dam up in the Peace Country. Now, there are $2, million, $2 billion, B, billion dollars into the project already. Uh, to stop it would mean $2 billion in remediation. To finish it could be another ten billion dollars now these are huge numbers and and when you start talking in b billions you're starting to talk about real money so we asked the utilities commission as we committed to in the election campaign the former government avoided the utilities commission and we said what do we do here where do we go from here are there better options how do we make sure that we're preserving the values in the peace country that are so critically important to the people there what are the indigenous issues for first nations people and so on and the commission came back with a report in a very short period of time, and I give them full marks for doing what would have been normally many, many months of work in just a few weeks. Uh, but in that process, we've had people taking shots at the assumptions that the uh, commission made. So we've asked, uh, the government has asked through the Ministry of Finance for some clarification. Hydro's asked for some clarification. And, and groups are emerging, those that are in favor of the dam, those that are opposed to the dam. Uh, First Nations groups that say they'll sue us if we proceed, other nations saying they'll sue us if we don't proceed. So I, I can't ask for a more complicated issue and I couldn't ask for uh, a, a more difficult time to make that decision after spending uh, on behalf of the people of BC almost three quarters of a billion dollars on firefighting this past summer. 
it wouldn't have been the best time to become the Premier of BC, Vaughn, as I guess my point. But in order to get the most information possible, we've invited six experts uh, that are well known in, in industry and in energy circles to come and give us their views. Just a 10, 15 minute presentation from each of them and then a bit of a debate. Looks it's like unusual. you brought in more antis than pro. Well, I don't look at it as pro or con because as you know, you've interviewed me on this program and if uh, the producers have been doing their work, they could have pulled up a dozen different perspectives that I've had on this question over the time. It, at one point? Yeah. it depends on where you are in the, in yeah. the economic cycle cycle and where, whether demand is up or demand is down, prices up, prices down and so on. So I look at these six individuals, people that I've, I've worked with, people that I know and that are well regarded, independent thinkers, all of them. Uh, getting their advice is going to help us make the best choice we can for people. And this is, a, as I say, a multi-billion dollar choice and I want to make sure we get it right. So the landowners have got a representative. Uh, their legal counsel will be one of the panel. Mark Jackard, uh, Nobel Prize winner, climate activist, former chair of the commission, uh, academic from SFU, a representative from industry on the uh, private power side. Uh, David Austin, uh, who would be in my estimation, and I've said this about him on this program as well, one of the, the sharpest minds on energy policy in British Columbia and a, and a constant uh, presence at the Utilities Commission when these issues are discussed, I would not want to paint him as pro or con anything. I would want to paint him as an expert who will be able to give my colleagues and I the best advice possible. So, uh, what... What's your, have you got a rough idea when the final decision's coming down? Uh, we have a... Uh, a path forward in terms of sh schedules for meetings the 30th we have a meeting on the 29th another meeting on the 30th with the uh, expert panel and then we'll be having final a final decision after we hear from, from the Ministry of Finance on the what are the rate implications for people going forward or stopping uh, what are the costs to the Treasury because if, if we uh, burn four billion dollars that's going to have an impact on our ability to build other projects, uh, vitally important hospitals and schools and, and transit mm -hmm. infrastructure in the Lower Mainland. So we need to take a look at what, our, what will happen to our credit rating in the marketplace. Uh, are we going to be able to continue to borrow money to build the infrastructure mm -hmm. that the public wants? <laughs> and what are the costs going to be if we go forward with a, a 10, 11, 12 billion dollar project? What are rates going to look like? So finance, the finance ministry and Carol James are going to uh, put together a package on that. So this has not just been a case of let's ask the Commission what they think and go from there. This is an opportunity at the two year, two and a half year point of a major capital project to take a pause and say is going forward better than stopping and and that's the question and uh, the challenge will be to my colleagues and I to make the best choice possible for people. When the decision is made, were you going to announce it up in the Northeast? where the project is or do it down here? Well, I, I see, I don't look at it as a Northeast project. Is the, uh, is the economic activity happening there? Yes. Uh, are there already two dams on the Peace River? Yes. But this is a piece of public infrastructure that has an impact not just in that region but all over the province. So I haven't decided where we're going to go to do that. Uh, I, 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 do, I will say that in the time, the five months that I've been Premier, uh, I've had two altercations uh, in the airport in Vancouver, both with someone who was adamant that Site C proceed. And uh, the last time that happened, uh, uh, I was engaging with a citizen. He was telling me his point of view. And uh, I didn't notice that there was a crowd gathering. And, <laughs> and I said that, look, this isn't about uh, the project. It's about the people of BC. It's a, four and a half million people are interested in this issue. It's not just you. And I started hearing clapping and I turned around and there was quite a crowd gathered. And, and within that crowd, there was a diversity of opinion. And, I, and it was almost like a, it was a bit of a focus group. It was a bit of a rally. And it was just me trying to get home uh, at the airport and a whole bunch of other people who are interested in this subject because it's going to have an impact on their lives. Uh, an awful lot of things I could ask you about. Uh, you did get one of your election promises through the House the other day, which is the ending of big money. Yeah. In politics in British Columbia, um, you did say before the election, you mocked the idea that the bill would include public funding of political parties, yet it does. It does. Is that what we call a broken promise? I would call it an amended promise, and I'm not being cute when I say this, Vaughn. Uh, when we were running for office as the Liberals and the Greens and other parties, we, we were hopeful to win a majority government where we could set an agenda and expect to be able to command the authority of the House to get our legislation passed. Uh, when we look at a minority parliament that could have, la could have perhaps lasted for six months, 12 months, 18 months, 
my uh, preoccupation when it came to getting big money out of politics was to get that done. And so I looked at the, rather than, as we had talked about, I might have even been on this show, uh, banning the big money and then asking uh, the uh, chief electoral officer to strike a committee to look at what other options there were to help finance political parties and finance elections in, in British Columbia. That was the plan. That was what we campaigned on. But the biggest issue was to get big money out. We had headlines in major U.S. newspapers. It was the story for many, many months here about the excesses of fundraising, uh, whether it be union or corporate donations or whether it was large donations from individuals influencing uh, public policy, perhaps only for their interests rather than the public interest. So we looked at other jurisdictions across the country and virtually all of them, when they get rid of big money, had put in some form of public allowance. The federal government did it, uh, Alberta did it, others have done it, uh, Quebec has done it, and, mm -hmm. and so on. So what we did is what I would like to think of as an innovation. We banned big money, the legislation passed this week, but we put in a public allowance, a public financing component that would be gone at the end of a four-year cycle. So in 2021, the public allowance will no longer be there. And a committee of the legislature, that legislature, four years out, will have to be struck to de decide whether they bring back public financing or leave it the way it is. What we were particularly concerned about was compliance. We wanted to make sure that political parties and people running for office would live within the law. And so we wanted to make sure that uh, there was a backstop of public financing, which other jurisdictions do, and that that would disappear over time. Now, the federal government, when they did it, they put in public financing and then another political party took it away. And that's fair enough. What we did was we, we tried to twist that a little bit by saying we're going to bring in a public allowance, but it's going to be temporary. And rather than have to uh, rely on the next government to take it away, the next government will have to decide whether to bring it back. So that was, that was our compromise. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to make sure, again, in a minority parliament, we have stability right now. I'm sure we'll talk about the relationship with the Green Party and the government. But, you know, at the time we introduced the legislation, at the time we were drafting it, there was no certainty that, uh, in fact, uh, we didn't know that Christy Clark was going to resign. We didn't know that we would find ourselves in a position of having a speaker from the opposition side. So our comfort, as it were, uh, as government is better than it was when we drafted the bill. So that was, that was the intent. Uh, I didn't mean to break any promises. And I think what I've done is met the primary objective of getting big money out and the allowance that was uh, that I that I mocked as you say will also be gone by the end of four years. Andrew McLeod of the Tai. Uh, uh, here goes Andrew. <clears throat> so far from you and your cabinet ministers the answer to many questions is that there's a lot of work to do making up for 16 years of mismanagement that the BC Liberals ran the province into the ground and it can't be fixed overnight. Uh, I'm wondering though how long you'll be able to give that kind of answer and when you think people will start holding you responsible. I think patience is running out on one of your biggest promises which is housing. You know yeah. it was I think one of the big issues that helped you win the election and certainly to pick up 10 seats in and around Metro Vancouver and um, you rightly said there was a crisis and you said you had the solution and I'm not sure you've rolled out much of a solution yet. Well, firstly, on, on the, the question of, of how long will the honeymoon be, uh, I was worried that the long period between the election and the swearing in, that the honeymoon would be over before we were even sworn in. So I'm, I'm pleased to be here at uh, the end of November, uh, feeling confident that we're doing our level best to meet the, the commitments we made to people during the campaign that make sure that the government was working for the people of BC. Uh, and so I, I think we're doing that as best we can. On the notion of at what point do you stop blaming the other guys, well, the other guys are still blaming us and they're in opposition. So they still talk about the 1990s as if it was, uh, if, I, I think they Just look yesterday. at it fondly now. So uh, uh, I think the public will forgive me if I highlight that many of the challenges that I'm facing are a result of liberal choices that I believe were not in the best interest of the public. On the housing file, look, I, I think we've made some tremendous strides and, and it's, it's been 17 weeks in government. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I appointed Selena Robinson to be not just responsible for housing, but transit as well, TransLink in the Lower Mainland and Municipal Affairs. And I did that because I believe all three of those ministries or all three of those responsibilities, if 
under the roof of one individual and one uh, group of decision makers will allow us to build more supply, which is one of the fundamental challenges we have. The previous government would say, well, it's the municipality's fault that things aren't moving quickly. We can't get permits in place for developments because of, of municipalities. Well, I, I don't think that helps when you blame someone else. So There is some truth to that. The, well, well there, is, there is truth to the fact that we need to do better. And municipalities understand that, and and they are, they're meeting with their public every day uh, in council chambers, and and they know that they need to find progress mostly on transit to move people around, mm -hmm. so that if you do have to move out of the place you work or distance from where you work, yeah. that you at least have an ability to get back and forth using public transit, and so putting TransLink and housing together means that you can start to plan density and denser communities that are connected to new and and existing transit links, but. You also have to deal with the demand question, which was the big issue that um, the Liberals just refused to address. And we saw a $600,000 increase over 18 months in the average cost of a home in the Lower Mainland. Now, wages did not go up by that amount. So clearly, there was some external factor that was leading to an increase in cost to, of housing in, in the region. Speculation uh, is the issue, and uh, talk of money laundering was perhaps uh, at the root of that. So we've been doing our level best to address some of those issues on ter in terms of the money laundering and speculation. Is offshore money having a distorting effect on, on the marketplace? And I certainly believe it is. So on the demand side, Carol James, the finance minister, has been looking at the foreign buyer's tax, has been looking at putting in place a tax to ensure that if, you are, if you're not paying income taxes in the jurisdiction, the chances are pretty good the money that you use to buy your home came from somewhere else. And so there's a, there, there are mechanisms that were suggested by academics uh, from UBC and SFU that we used as part of our platform, and, and we're looking at how we can implement those in our first budget come February. Now, I realize that people want solutions tomorrow to the problems of today, but we've been in power for just 16, 17 weeks. We tabled a budget in, or an update in September, which was really making sure that we could get enough money to provide programs for people in the, the year we're in, which is half over, more than half over, and that we're focusing on having a comprehensive plan for February next year when we have our budget. And the other piece that I want to throw in before we get to the next issue is a federal housing strategy. Mm. Uh, we knew it, going into the election campaign that Mr. Trudeau and his team were talking about getting back into the housing business, which is something that had been a field that had been vacated for 15, 20 years by the federal government. Now we know, just yesterday, the federal government announced their national housing strategy, some $40 billion in investments on the, on the uh, supply side. That gives us more freedom to make sure that we can address the demand side. Uh, and now we have all of the, the pieces of the puzzle in place and we're going to be driving over the Christmas period and into our budget in February to meet the, the commitments we made during the campaign. Take a brief break on Voice of BC with Premier John Horgan. We'll be back, and there's a lot more to talk about, so stay with us. Since this government uh, was sworn in to power, they have taken the initiative to start addressing the challenges that face the delivery of health care services in British Columbia. In particular, there was a bold move to establish a new ministry for mental health and substance use, uh, which is a critical issue for communities across British Columbia. As the union that has many professionals who work with the mental health care team, we're happy to see this initiative take place. Wait, stop, don't turn that dial. More's coming up as you're watching Voice of BC on Shaw TV. I'm Andrew Weaver, leader of the BC Green Party. There are more ways to connect with us at Voice of BC. Email us at vobc at shaw.ca. Follow us on Twitter at Voice of BC. Or like us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash vobc on Shaw TV. Many people, I think, look very um, 
favorably upon the government's uh, decision to uh, challenge vigorously uh, Kinder Morgan. But there's a lot that's brewing in the background in terms of how rigorously government approaches uh, monitoring and enforcing uh, major industries operating in the province, like the mining sector and the natural gas sector. It's going to be very interesting to see how this government handles regulating those industries. Welcome back to Voice of BC, and here we are again with the Premier, and um, I think we'll go to question on tape right away, because uh, we've got a few of those to get through, and this is Bill Thielman. Oh, he always has fun. Here's Bill. Premier, Green Party leader Andrew Weaver a while back said that NDP election promises were, quote, irrelevant to him, didn't matter at all. Did you find that annoying or a little upsetting that Mr. Weaver would do that? And is it true? Uh, <laughs> well, it has been uh, actually a, a quite a, a positive experience uh, getting to better understand Andrew Weaver and how he approaches uh, political life. As you know, he was an academic who came in uh, surprisingly uh, in 2013, uh, knocking off a very capable incumbent in Ida Chong in Oak Bay Gordon Head. And he set about being a, a one-man wrecking crew as a, the leader of the Green Party, uh, characterized as an independent because he wasn't, there wasn't formal party status. And uh, as we worked together in opposition, we didn't have a lot in common. We touched upon the same issues, but it was only when we had, and even during the election campaign, uh, they were, we were fishing in the same pool for the same boats, uh, particularly here in my hometown in Victoria, lower, lower uh, Vancouver Island. So it was, no one was more surprised than Andrew and I that we actually get along quite well. And that uh, we come, we're about the same age, we grew up in the same town, we have the same cultural touch points, we both like sports, uh, we both like vigorous debate. Uh, so we've become, I would characterize us as, uh, as friends, but also uh, Andrew's fiercely focused on making sure that the Green Party maintains its autonomy as an individual party we talked in the discussions about forming an alliance, uh, about what that would look like. And right from the start, Andrew was absolutely convinced he didn't want a cabinet position. He didn't want to be part of a coalition. He would support the government on supply matters, budget matters, so that we could continue to bring forward good policies. And we worked together uh, on, on a bunch of issues. We had a, just uh, recently an amendment that was rejected by the speaker because it was coming from an opposition member and it had something to do with money. You're not allowed to do that, as you know, in our... You can't make an amendment to a bill that has an implication yeah. to the Crown, the cost to the Crown. So we took the Green Amendment, uh, we made it our own amendments, and passed it. And so this is the sort of cooperation that Andrew got into politics to, to fight for. And it's something that, as, as a 12-year member of the opposition, I believe is absolutely appropriate. There are 87 people in the legislature, all of them capable, all of them coming from communities uh, from the Peace Country to uh, the Cape Scott to Prince Rupert to Puskupi, all of the communities in the province represented in one building. Why not take those outstanding individuals who put their hands up and been elected by a majority of their, their community and ask them what's best for BC? That's Andrew's motivation. That's my motivation. So there are times, absolutely, when uh, he takes shots at me, and that's okay. I'm fine with that. We both know that we can agree to disagree as long as we keep focused on the values that brought us together, which is, firstly, making sure that uh, this, the legislature works effectively, uh, climate, climate action, important to both of us, uh, Getting a, a, a referendum out on proportional representation was something I wanted. Uh, Mr. Weaver wanted to go straight to implementing PR, or proportional representation. Mm -hmm. I disagreed with that. Uh, we talked it out. We hashed it out. And, and he's come on side. There will be a referendum. The public will be asked what their views are on the matter. Uh, we had to water down some of our ideas. He's had to water down some of his. And I think that makes for better outcomes. Uh, Irene Lanzinger, uh, BC Fed, uh, asking about something that was missing from the September budget update, and we're told to expect it in February, but let's let Irene ask the question. Premier Horgan, we know your government is committed to good jobs, but people face many barriers in terms of jobs, and one of them is child care, and that's a particular challenge for women re-entering the workforce. Your government committed to a $10 a day child care plan. 
Will we see that reflected in the February budget? And I heard you say something interesting the other day when you were with the Prime Minister, that you need a federal partner to make the full program work. Is, is Ottawa going to be there to help pay for this? We were, the, pre the Prime Minister and I were at an event called uh, Women Deliver. It's a massive uh, convention that will be coming to Vancouver in 2019. And um, Madame Gregoire, uh, the Prime Minister's wife, is a patron of this organization. And so he and uh, she were in Vancouver. They asked me to come and participate in the, the launch of the event. And, and in my remarks, I said, it was, I, although we have uh, we went out, I went out of my way, we went out of our way to ensure that we had gender parity in our cabinet. The first cabinet in BC history that's 50% men and 50% women. And that's a good step in the right direction. We've had a female premier. We've had two female premiers. We've had female speakers. We have a female lieutenant governor. So British Columbians, I believe, are as focused as anyone in Canada on making sure we see gender equity. But we've got a long way to go on equal pay for work of equal value and we have miles to go on childcare. So in my remarks to this group as we launched this uh, uh, Women Deliver conference, it was it's not good enough to just be at the table. You have to make sure that when you're at the table, you're talking about the things that matter to women. And one of those fundamental issues, as Irene says, and women and families will say wherever you go, is if I don't have a place that's safe and accessible and affordable for my kids, I'm not going to go back into the workforce. And when that happens, that, that, that means that the family is losing economic opportunity, the community is losing economic opportunity, and British Columbia is losing economic opportunity. So childcare is not about babysitting, it's an economic policy. And I'm committed to that, to our government's committed to that. But in our discussions with the Green Party, and I'm, this isn't a blame exercise, Andrew Weaver and his colleagues have a different perspective. They absolutely support accessible, universal, affordable childcare. But they had some issues with how we messaged the question mm -hmm. during the campaign. So this is one of those examples where we have, where our values are in line. The question is, how do we implement it in a way that, that is, meets the needs of the Greens, meets the needs of New Democrats, and I'm hopeful meets the needs of Liberals. At the end of the day, it's about families and people, and I'm committed to making sure that we have uh, the, the framework at a minimum. And I, don't, and I hope that this doesn't come back to be, oh, there he's, he's obfuscating or he's skating on the issue. We're going to have childcare in British Columbia. If we have a federal partner, it'll be better childcare. And sooner. Correct. Yeah. Uh, Jock Finlayson, uh, this is something else that was in your platform, discussed before the election. We're still asking questions about it afterward. Here's Jock. Premier, another element of the NDP election platform since reiterated in the throne speech is your government's commitment to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, UNDRIP. Uh, you have said, in common with the Trudeau government in Ottawa, that your government will embrace the basic content and principles of UNDRIP. My question is this, how do you communicate to investors in the business community what this actually means in practice? What will embracing UNDRIP entail in terms of the decision-making authority of the Crown over land, resources, permits, tenures, licenses, and things like that? which are so critical to our economy in BC, given the important role resources play in underpinning this province's prosperity. Uh, always good questions from Jock, uh, thoughtful uh, economist who understands our economy very, very well. And he also, I believe, understands that the landscape in British Columbia has been changing, whether policymakers are keeping pace with it or not. And that's through court decisions, successive court decisions about rights and title and how in the vast majority of British Columbia is unceded indigenous territory. There are only treaties in a few places. Many of those treaties have only come into being in the recent memory. So we have an issue about ownership of land. And the Silcotine or the Chilcotin decision from 2014 made it abundantly clear that this was no longer a debate about uh, law, it was a debate about land. And a map has been determined to be Chilcotin territory. This tree to that tree to that mountain to that river is Chilcotin territory. As my home is registered with the assessment authority and the land titles uh, office, it belongs to me. Well, this land belongs to the Chilcotin and that map will be growing all around British Columbia as other indigenous groups and, and First Nations uh, make their title claims known. So we can go through court case after court case after court case over many decades and fight about these issues, 
or we can embrace the notion that rights and title exist and that we can work towards finding a way for all of us to prosper in the abundance that we have here in British Columbia. That was the commitment that we made during the election campaign and it included three elements. Firstly, embracing the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, as the federal government has done and as other countries around the world have done that have Indigenous populations. Uh, secondly, to make sure that uh, true reconciliation as part of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that was uh, put forward by the federal government to address uh, the wrongs of residential schools, that the recommendations in, the, in that report were implemented here in BC. And then lastly, rights and title. We have to figure that out. So I've been talking to resource industries, mostly in the forestry sector. Uh, it's an area I know very well. I, I, one of my first orders of business after being sworn in was to go to Washington to fight for a fair softwood lumber deal for workers and communities. And so in the process of that, I've been building relationships with uh, forest executives. And they asked me the same questions that Jock does. Well, what does this mean? And I said, well, it means that uh, you're dealing with uh, the government of British Columbia when it comes to crown land and when it comes to rent for the resources that you're extracting or, or, or bringing it to market. And it's incumbent upon government to talk to First Nations governments about how we share in that abundance. And it's not about double taxation. It's not about companies or investors having to pay this group and that group and the next group. It's about governments, nation to nation, uh, federal, provincial and First Nation coming up with mechanisms to make sure that the prosperity that we want for everyone is most importantly also there for First Nations. It hasn't been to this point in time and that's why we're committed to these exercises. It's not about a veto. I've been asked this repeatedly. First Nations don't want to say no. They want to be part of yes. And that's my commitment to the people of BC, to investors, and most importantly to First Nations communities. And we had a gathering, and this was started by uh, the former government, uh, First Nations gatherings every September. Uh, chiefs, uh, leaders from all across the province come to the Lower Mainland, and they meet with Cabinet and, and the Premier, and they talk about issues of mutual concern. I'd always been skeptical about this in, in opposition. We were never invited. Uh, but having uh, the opportunity to oversee my first uh, leaders gathering. We invited uh, opposition members to come we, and many of them did. I was very pleased to see John Rustad, for example, the former Minister of Indigenous Relations from Prince George. He came at our invitation so that we could make this a nonpartisan question. Every community needs to see growth and prosperity and everyone in the community should be benefiting from that and that's what, for me, what UNDRIP means. Um made one change on this one already and uh, I think it takes effect next year. How's the money going to be spent? Everybody wants to know. Here's Chris Sims. Your government recently announced that the BC carbon tax will no longer be revenue neutral. Now we know that it hasn't been revenue neutral for many years and in fact it's a huge tax grab but you've also absolved yourself of the responsibility of telling British Columbians where you're spending that carbon tax money. So can you tell us here on the program, where are you going to be spending that BC carbon tax? Are you going to give it to the city of Vancouver? It goes up uh, five bucks uh, a liter. April no, 1st. No, not five bucks. Five a bucks a ton. Five bucks a, a ton. It's yeah. about two cents a liter. A little bit less than uh, that. Yeah, yeah, April 1st and yeah. then every year after that. That's right. right? And that yeah. was one of, the, uh, one of the parts of the agreement with the, the Green Caucus. Uh, we had a plan, and the, the federal government is mandating or directing provinces to have a, a carbon price of $50 a ton by 2022. We have an advantage here in BC because we're already at 30 bucks. So we only have another $20 to go to get to where uh, all of the other provinces in Canada have to get in the next uh, five years. So uh, our plan was to start later in that period in 2020 and go up each of the, those three years by six, six and seven percent. Uh, the Green Caucus said, no, we need to move faster. We wanted, they wanted to send a signal because there hadn't been an increase mm -hmm. in the carbon price for a period of time under the, the Christie Clark Liberals. And I agreed with that. I said it, it didn't have a significant impact on our direction. And that direction was to no longer make the, in, the increases revenue neutral. We wanted to make those increases part and parcel of driving down emissions and that means putting money into retrofits, not just in Vancouver, but right across BC. Investing in transit, largely in Vancouver, but not just in Vancouver. So using revenue from a green tax for green initiatives. Uh, Bruce Halzer, that's a good question. Uh, big news out of uh, Alaska just the other day. Bruce is wondering if we missed the boat. Here he is. 
there's recently been an uptick in LNG prices, and all of a sudden we have stories about uh, the possible development uh, of the LNG industry in BC that six months ago everybody said was dead. Do you think that's a realistic possibility, or has BC missed the boat on LNG? I was referring to the announcement China and Alaska have done a deal for LNG. Or where do we stand? Are we we missed it this time? No, I don't think so. I think um, there were, I think the former government overpromised uh, at a time when and, and made uh, out unrealistic expectations part and parcel of their campaign back in 2013. There was going to be no debts in BC. The 100,000 jobs and uh, taxes three were going to disappear. Three count of the three. Uh, three by LNG 2017. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And while we're there, and there are none. Uh, I was up in Kitimat a few weeks ago, uh, an industrial community. Uh, there are two proposals still on the books there, one called LNG Canada and the other one called Kitimat LNG. Both projects supported by the Heisland Nation, the indigenous people in the region. Both projects overwhelmingly supported by the council, which is a diverse council of liberals, New Democrats, mm -hmm. uh, and also the vast majority of the community. Uh, it's, uh, both are proposed to be on ex former industrial sites, so there's no impact on uh, on uh, natural environment. It's, it's taking a brown field and making it more productive. And the LNG Canada site particularly is appealing because it's a Shell Canada project. 50% of the project is uh, owned by Shell. Uh, the other three partners are Kogas, which is a co big Korean operation, Mitsubishi, which people will know as a large Japanese concern, and PetroChina. So the other three partners are takers in the LNG marketplace. They use LNG uh, for energy needs in those, in those three countries, China, Korea, and Japan. Uh, I'm going to be visiting those three countries in January. I'm going to be talking to those sectors. And I'm going to be saying that British Columbia uh, will be welcoming their investment uh, to provide LNG to their marketplace under certain conditions. And those conditions have been in place in my mind uh, in, as part of our policy for some time. We have to make sure that we're creating jobs for British Columbians. We don't want to just have a, a, a raft of temporary foreign workers coming and erecting a plant and then leaving town. We want to make sure we're creating jobs and opportunity for people. We want to make sure that the people who own the gas, the people of BC, get a fair return for that gas. That First Nations are full partners, and that's certainly the case with both uh, LNG Canada and Kitimat LNG. And lastly, that it has, uh, not, doesn't have a significant impact on our air, water, and land. So our climate action plan that contemplates an LNG plant or two, uh, as did the former Liberal plan. So I think we can meet our objectives on climate action, provided that uh, when we work with these companies that they look at electrification of their, uh, their, uh, uh, their uh, liquefaction process, and some of them are prepared to do that. I know the Shell proposal particularly wants to be the greenest in the world. Shell has deep pockets, their th three partners have deep pockets, and if the price gets to the right point, I, I could see that happening in the next uh, six to 12 months. This deal that you have with, uh, with Weaver, and I should have asked this earlier, but it's the CASA. The, yep. the, he agrees, the Greens agree, to support your government on budget and supply so the government gets its budget through the House. And, but there's an interesting, uh, uh, what, the re, there's a reciprocal agreement on your part to keep him in the loop and to not turn other matters into confidence Correct. matters. Yeah. So they're allowed to vote against you on other things if they choose. Does that create a situation where the old thing that was available to majority premiers always, which is a snap election, an early election, that effectively you're precluded from doing that unless the Greens defeat you in the House? Uh, well, you know, I, I'm not sure, Vaughn, uh, to be, give you the direct answer. I'm not contemplating calling an election mm -hmm. anytime soon. I am excited about getting up every day. Well, the day next election is scheduled four years from now. For, right? That's right, four years from now. And um, I'm going to work every day to have confidence, not just of the Green Party, but as many of the Liberals as I can muster. And more importantly, the confidence of the people of B.C. I believe in proportional representation. I think that uh, minorities can work. And so I'm motivated, uh, as is Mr. Weaver, to make sure that we, we can agree to disagree. And if, we, if we, a, a vote fails in the legislature, that's not the end of the world. And uh, it's only on matters of confidence, on budgets 
and so on. So the Greens will support us on budget matters. They don't have to support us on anything else. And, and I think that over we will lose votes in the weeks and months and years ahead. And I'm okay with that. You know what? Most of the public won't even know that the votes have happened. And so on issues where we disagree, Mr. Weaver has a different view on LNG, for example. I'm going to be working extra hard to convince him that the investment, private investment in the Northeast, or and pardon me, in the Northwest, will so help us in delivering on our other initiatives and also drive us to be more focused on reducing emissions from transportation, reducing emissions uh, from our housing sector, that we'll actually get more economic activity as a result of that. And, and he's persuaded, I mean, he's evidence-based. He wants to hear the evidence mm -hmm. and, and uh, it's up to me and my colleagues to give him the, the case for proceeding and I'm, I'm sure we can. We'll take a brief break on Voice of BC again with Premier John Horgan. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Well, there are some who say that the NDP in Alberta have governed quite ideologically, uh, whereas the BC NDP are much more likely to be pragmatic, especially based on their experience uh, 16 years ago of being in government. And so the, I guess one of the big questions is exactly how aggressive, how, how ideological uh, do people think that the NDP will be in BC in governing, especially as it relates to small business issues, of course. Hi, I'm Stephanie Smith, president of the BC GEU. Quick, run to the fridge, but get right back because you don't want to miss the rest of Voice of BC. I'm Wendell Clark with a word about winning. We all know it takes a team effort in any sport and with any challenge. You can be a part of the winning team that shuts out impaired driving. Whether you're out on the town or just hanging out with friends, drink responsibly. Always have a plan for a safe ride home for yourself, your family, and your friends. You'll be helping to shut out impaired driving. Visit ArriveAlive.org to find out more. Arrive Alive. Drive sober. Premier John Horgan is a huge lacrosse fan, and I'd have to say watching him in the legislature and beyond, he's been playing some very good lacrosse, politically speaking. He hasn't been taken into the boards, he hasn't lost the ball, he hasn't scored on his own net, he's been playing very well. But how long can it go on? It's a tough game in politics and lacrosse, and sooner or later he's going to get cross-checked, body-checked, slammed, and I think he'll still be okay, but he's got to be watching for it. Referendum. Yes, well, we'll have Thielman uh, taking a run at the Premier in just a minute on uh, one of his favorite issues, but uh, I'm going to go straight to Jamie Lawson at the uh, Political Science Department at UVic because this is something that is going to keep this government incredibly busy next year, and it's not something that they even ask for, but they have to deal with it. Here's Jamie. The federal government is trying to move quickly to press all the provinces to come through with their plans for marijuana legalization. And this is an important policy matter on a lot of fronts for BC, being one of the top producers and one of the top consumers in the federation. What are your priorities as government to make sure this transition works well for British Columbians? And Mike Farmerth was on the show. You've given him the file. Uh, and he says, I think, 18 pieces of provincial legislation that have to be dealt with to make this happen by Canada Day next summer. That's right. And we also have to work mu with municipalities, those that have already been issuing uh, business permits to dispensaries for medicinal marijuana, largely lower mainland driven than in, here in the South Island. But there are dispensaries all around uh, British Columbia. That has to be factored in as well. The federal government's come up now with an excise tax, which was not on the table as recently as uh, September. So that's another complication. We had uh, Governor Jay Inslee from Washington State here this past week um, addressed our legislature. And Washington State has uh, legalized marijuana through referendum uh, three years now, I think. Uh, and his advice to me, and he had much advice, but we have to be careful about what we set as the price for sale in public outlets, whether it be liquor stores, uh, 
dispensaries, pharmacies, where, wherever we're going to distribute from. If the price is too high, the black market will continue to exist. And the biggest issue for Farnworth is to make sure that the law enforcement component doesn't eat up any revenue that we might get. And in fact, cost us money at the end of the day. And so uh, I'm concerned, first and foremost, about making sure that we keep uh, this controls substance away from kids. We're going to set an age the same as the drinking age. I think it's easier to manage that way. Uh, we have a whole bunch of things to do, but this is a mature market, as uh, uh, the professor says. Uh, we know a lot about marijuana here in British Columbia. Uh, there is a, a distribution system of sorts in place. Uh, there's a high quality product in the market, uh, and so so I'm told. Th so I'm told. I'm <laughs> advised, uh, but there there are opportunities for economic development here, and opportunities for uh, revenue for other programs. So there's a, a bunch of upsides, but there's a whole bunch of downsides as well. And my first uh, first minister's meeting, uh, the, the the new kid in the block. I come from BC, where BC Bud is king, and all the other premiers around the table are saying we'll never meet this. Uh, July deadline. I said, ah, oh, just relax, sit back, you'll be fine, <laughs> have another b bag of Doritos. And uh, so they, they were kind of uh, laughing at me for being so optimistic about being able to meet these timelines. But it, as now we look at December, it's right around the corner and we've got a lot of work to do. But uh, as I say, I think the public is well ahead of policymakers on this question. Yeah. And uh, we're going to do our level best to meet the, the federal uh, requirements. The thing that Farmer talked about on the show that fascinated me because it had never occurred to me, Ottawa controls the licensing for production. But he said, look, um, some of the best marijuana in the country is produced in British Columbia, but not only that, it's a big part of the regional economy. It's underground, but it's not all organized crime. Mm -hmm. It's the local guy who's been growing dope on his island or his back lot or whatever. And, and Farmer said that it, he thought it was very important that British Columbia continue that, gain access to the production licenses, so that our equivalent, marijuana equivalent of craft breweries and exactly. specialty wine producers can be producing marijuana. But I, I don't know, is Ottawa receptive to that idea at all? Uh, I put that on the table uh, back in April when I was, uh, pardon me, October when I was in, in Ottawa. And uh, it wasn't dismissed out of hand. And we've been in our correspondence back and forth uh, through uh, Minister Farnworth and through my office have made the case that this is an economic development opportunity. And BC has a unique climate in this regard. In fact, uh, we could have 12-month 12, 12 growing seasons here on Vancouver Island at least. And, and there is a, a, a sophisticated distribution network. And what we want to do is eliminate the criminal elements. But we don't necessarily want to eliminate the, the expertise that people have developed in this area. And as I say, the public is well ahead of this. It's not, you know, I, I mean, uh, there are, you'd be surprised that the, the people who uh, enjoy a bit of marijuana at the end of a day or at the end of a week as they would a cocktail or a, or a glass of beer. So I, I think that the public is, is well past uh, the... Um, the prohibition period and and now we have to find a way to make sure and 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 the medicinal opportunities what amazed me Vaughn we invited a couple of doctors to come and talk to us about cannabinoids and their potential for health breakthroughs and while the product was illegal the research was stilted they're stiltified stultified because people yeah. weren't prepared to take the risks but once the product is legal there could be enormous health breakthroughs as a result of uh, research and it's not just about smoking there are the edibles issue is one that I'm, I'm a bit concerned about. Health officials have talked about making sure we're, we're gauging the amount of THC, the, the, uh, the active ingredient in, in cannabis. Uh, so we have to, we, there's a whole bunch of health and safety issues that we have to deal with as well. It's not just about putting up a, a stand and saying, buy your marijuana here. I think a lot of people think it's that simple, but it's not. The economic challenge though, it, or the economic opportunity is to, to not allow other jurisdictions to corner the market on distribution uh, as a result of a federal process. And we've made it clear to, to Ottawa that we don't want to participate in that. I uh, heard you give a speech uh, here a little while ago to uh, the BC Federation of Labor Conference, and among things you said uh, in awarding big government contracts, it's not going to be low bid, it's going to be best bid. Uh, here with a question about that, Jordan Bate. Nearly a quarter million British Columbians work in construction. It's almost 10% of the provincial economy. Of those quarter million British Columbians, about 20% are in the traditional building trades unions. The other 80% are in employee associations, they're non-union, or they're in progressive unions. Yet at the BC Federation of Labour recently, 
You said you wanted to tilt the playing field in favor of those building trades workers. Is that fair to the other 80% of construction workers in British Columbia? And is it fair to the taxpayers who will end up paying more for construction projects? I always believe that if you're spending public money on uh, a piece of public infrastructure, you should get maximum public benefit from that. And that means not just uh, making sure that skilled workers are getting an opportunity to, uh, <laughs> to apply their trade, but also it's an opportunity to train the next generation of skilled workers. So having apprenticeship ratios in place so that we can ensure that uh, <laughs> we've got an alarm going. We've got an alarm in going. Building. This is an old government building. Yeah. And there's an alarm going. So which uh, just proves to you folks it's live television. Yeah, that's right. We're here yeah. and the yeah. bells are ringing. And it's not yeah. a vote, which yeah. people might think. Yeah. So best bid means what's the community benefit to spending our tax dollars to create something, whether it be a hospital, whether it be a transit line, whether it be a dam. BC Hydro, until just recently, the Site C project had always had in place project labor agreements is what they were called, which ensured local procurement so that small businesses in the region got the benefit from any big project in, in town. That local workers were the first in line to get those jobs and that also you were able to hire uh, or, or train apprentices for the next generation. I think that's what, that's certainly my intent. I, I'm not wanting to exclude anyone. I want to be more inclusive. I noticed uh, your BC Hydro now under new management uh, is still putting out the Site C numbers and I noticed just on this apprenticeship issue uh, there's still almost listed 2,000 people working there, 49 listed apprentices, yeah. which is the building trades have been pushing for 25% on, That's right. on a contract. If there's, if there's three then there should be one apprentice. So. Clearly, that's something that whatever else one thinks about Site C, the target is not being met there. And that's, in my opinion, because they didn't commit. Hydro was not obliged to commit to making sure we're training people for the next generation of workers. And we are all aging. Uh, we have a, a serious gray tsunami coming our way. We've been talking about this in BC for two decades. And if we're not training the next generation, not just by creating spaces in our post-secondary institutions, critically important, but giving them practical applications on a work site, then we're not going to be able to build for the next 20, 30, 40 years. I, I, I'm, I'm, I think people should not be afraid of community benefits when it comes to spending public money. They should embrace it. And most people I talk to, when you say we want to make sure that more women are in the trades, we want to make sure that we're, we're representing the community at work sites, I think most people go, yeah, that's okay by me. Bill Tillman, I said he was going to have a, a question to give the Premier a hard time on something, so uh, this is an issue on which he disagrees with you. Here's Bill. That's certainly Premier Horgan, you know that I opposed the single transferable vote in both 2005 and 2009 with the referendums, and I'll be opposing the proportional representation proposal, unknown yet, in 2018. You've said you're going to campaign in favor of it, can you give us some idea what that means? Are you going to go out and stump on a daily basis or something lesser than that? And we'll update people. Uh, today the government has established a website where people who want to know more about this and, and contribute to the kind of ballot we're going to have and the questions that will be raised in the referendum can go on and answer a questionnaire. Uh, you can find it on the government website, Ministry of Attorney General. So uh, we're moving along on finding out what people want. Them. That's right. Where the, the survey that you can access on the website is to help us shape the question that we'll ask. Uh, we don't, we're not sure what that's going to be yet. Uh, Bill talked about the single transferable vote which was on the ballot in 2005 and 2009 and, and I've said again on this show that in 2005 I voted against proportional representation because I was comfortable with what I knew and I was running for office at that time. Then I was elected and for four years had zero influence on public policy. And then uh, in 2009 I had a chance to vote for, on the very same question and I voted in favor of it because I thought uh, perfection is the enemy of progress. We need to change how we elect people so that everyone can be engaged. I said at the top of the show, Vaughn, there are 87 members of the legislature, all of them capable individuals that were selected by their peers to come to Victoria and represent the interests of town A, B or C. And if we're going to be working for people, we need to make sure that everybody's engaged, not just the people who are on the winning team. And uh, I'm a competitive sports guy and I appreciate uh, going at it, uh, lacrosse, basketball, you name it, politics. 
But at the end of the day, we're all doing this to make life better for our communities. And, and I think you can better do that by having a legislature that reflects the range of values in the community, not just the values of the people who won the election. And so I'm going to be supporting the proportional representation question that comes forward. We've had to separate. David Eby is the Attorney General. He has to be meticulously independent in this because he is going to be overseeing the referendum and the question as it's developed. And so that's a difficult hand for him to, to manage, but I'm very confident that he'll be able to do that. My role, uh, once the question is, uh, is established, is to make the case to support it. And I will be asking citizens to embrace proportional representation because I think it's a better way for the public to have confidence that when we elect someone, they'll have a say in outcomes for people. I've heard NDP supporters say they can't understand why the NDP would support this. It would mean you'll never form a majority government again. Uh, well, we haven't formed a majority government since 1996. I sit here before you as Premier because of a coalition uh, or a, an agreement between yeah. two parties. 60, almost 60 percent of the people who cast ballots cast ballots in favor of change in, in May. And they were given that change in the form of a coalition uh, an agreement between two political parties. I'm going to work, as is Andrew Weaver and his colleagues, as hard as I can to demonstrate to the people of BC that a minority is not a bad thing. In fact, you're going to get a better outcome. I said to the, uh, uni uh, the Urban Development Institute the yeah. other day at a luncheon, uh, they said, well, you must be disappointed you didn't win a majority. And I thought, well, you'd think that, wouldn't you? But I have to work harder and better and smarter in a minority than I would have otherwise. So the arrogance that often sets in, and you've been canvassing politics for many, many years here, Vaughn. Never run it, into any arrogance yet. <laughs> Over time, the, the tyranny of the majority yeah. uh, can be, well, we're going to do it anyway. We've got the numbers, we're going to do it. In a minority situation, you can't just rely on the numbers. You have to rely on the power of your argument. And that is where Andrew and I have formed, Andrew Weaver and I have formed a relationship because I have to convince him and he has to convince me that his idea or my idea are valid. And I think that's what the legislature's always been about, but not in a majority situation because it doesn't matter what your ideas are, the government's going to forge ahead with their plan regardless. And, and I think if we can demonstrate that a minority can work, that will bring even maybe even Bill Thielman on side <laughs> to have uh, proportional representation as the way we elect our representatives. I think he's already formed his anti-committee, but we shall see. Ben Parfit, we got a couple minutes left. Good question from Ben. Here he is. Many years ago, under the previous NDP administration, the Oil and Gas Commission was created essentially as a one-stop shop for uh, energy industry regulatory approvals. We've seen in recent months, however, that the Commission appears to be failing miserably in enforcing environmental rules. We know, for example, that roughly 50 unregulated or unlicensed dams have been built by fracking companies on the Oil and Gas Commission's watch. Is it time for compliance and enforcement powers with the Oil and Gas Commission to be taken away and placed with another provincial agency? we got a bit more than a minute. I'm sorry, there's not much time. Yeah. Well, uh, Ben and I have talked about this offline. Uh, I know his concerns. His, his, the revelation of 50-some uh, uh, tailings ponds or, or processed water dams that are not being appropriately uh, regulated or enforced uh, is disconcerting. And, and we, we've looked into that. George Heyman uh, and uh, the minister responsible, Michelle Mongal, have been working together to try and find ways to make sure that enforcement and compliance can be done in a way that gives the public confidence. At the end of the day, uh, our systems fail if the public has no confidence in them. So uh, Ben's absolutely right. We're going to do what we can to make sure that the existing Oil and Gas Commission a regulatory a regime is either, e either being enforced. If it's not, well, then we'll bring in others to do so. And Michelle Mungal told the House this week uh, that the government is also uh, asking for names, getting ready to appoint a panel on uh, scientific review of fracking That's in right. the New Year as well, yeah. right? Yeah. So you're not doing a moratorium on fracking. No, no, no. Uh, and when I was energy spokesperson uh, before the 2013 election, we made the commitment to do a, 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 an exhaustive review to demonstrate again, give the public confidence that, that the practices in British Columbia are acceptable uh, compared to other jurisdictions and that we're protecting our air, water and land here. If the public has no confidence in the processes, then you've got to make some amendments and that's what we'll do. 
That uh, fire alarm, if you can hear it, folks, is pretty darn interesting. Yeah. But as I said, it's proof that we were live tonight, uh, and the place is really jumping. Uh, thank you to Premier Horton. For Great to be show. here, Mom. I appreciate being on. This is parents number 15 now on Voice of BC, so we'll see. Uh, thanks for watching Voice of BC, bringing the legislature BC politics into your living room. Good night. The following is a community access program. While this program does not necessarily reflect the views of Shaw or its employees, Shaw is proud to support local producers and share local voices, ideas, and opinions. To find out more about community access television, training, and volunteer opportunities, please visit shawtv.ca.